עוד לא? עכשיו. טוב, אני... בועז, תודה רבה על דברי הפתיחה. Uh, עכשיו עופרה תגיד את דברי הפתיחה שלה, אני אציג את... Uh, um, קצת לפני כן אנחנו עשינו שינוי בסדר היום, זאת אומרת אני ביקשה להקדים את ההרצאה על... שהמושב הראשון יהיה המושב על הטלפתיה והמושב השני יהיה מה שאמור להיות המושב הראשון, לכן עשינו, עשינו שינוי גם בסדר. Uh, ועכשיו עופרה תגיד את דברי הפתיחה שלה, אני אציג את עופרה עכשיו. עופרה אשל היא, היא פסיכולוגית קלינית ופסיכואנטיקאית מנחה מדריכה ומורה במכון ובחברה הפסיכואנליטית בישראל, סגנית נשיא איגוד ויניקוט הבינלאומי, מקימה וראש מסלול הלימודים המתקדמים, הזרם העצמאי בפסיכואנליזה ופורצי דרכים, התוכנית לפסיכותרפיה, הפקולטה לרפואה, אוניברסיטת תל אביב, היא מרצה אורחת בסייקואנליטיק אינסטיטוט אוף נורת' קליפורניה, סן פרנסיסקו, והיא מורה גם בתוכנית הליבה ובמסלול מצבים מנטליים ראשוניים, התוכנית לפסיכותרפיה, אוניברסיטת תל אביב, במעשה הטיפולי, לימודים לפסיכותרפיסטים מתקדמים במרכז הלימודים של החברה הפסיכואנליטית, במבטים, מחלקה לפסיכולוגיה של אוניברסיטת בר אילן. היא עורכת מדור ביקורות ספרים בשיחות, כתב עת ישראלי לפסיכותרפיה, וזוכת פרס הבינלאומי על שם טסטינג לשנת 2013, ופרס סימונס בניו יורק לשנת 2017. היא ערכה במשותף עם צביה זליגמן את הספר, היה או לא היה, כאשר צלילים של פגיעה מינית בילדות עולים בטיפול. ובעיקר עופרה, מי שמכיר אותה, יש לה זמן ויש לה אימפקט גדול מאוד על כל מי שמכיר אותה. אז עופרה, בבקשה. טוב, אחרי, אחרי הדברים הנפלאים של בועז ואוגדן, אני עוברת... אחרי הדברים היפים של בועז ואוגדן, אני עוברת ללאה גולדברג ולעברית. בארץ אהבתי השקד פורח, בארץ אהבתי מחכים לאורח, כותבת לאה גולדברג. ארץ אהבתי היום היא ארץ אהבה מש... ארץ אהבתי היום בסדר? היא ארץ אהבה משולשת. אהבתי לטיפול הנפשי באוריינטציה פסיכואנליטית, אהבתי לוויניקוט ולביון המאוחר, שני פסיכואנליטיקאים גדולים, ייחודיים, שנותנים לנו חוטר ידנה לאחוז בו ולהעיז ללכת עם הייחודיות שבתוכנו. ואהבתי למסלול הזרם העצמאי, פורצי דרכים בפסיכואנליזה. שבו אנו פוגשים, חושבים וחווים את הדרכים החדשות האלו בחשיבה הפסיכואנליטית ובטיפול הנפשי. לארץ אהבתי זו מגיעה היום אורחת מיוחדת, הפסיכואנליטיקאית דוקטור אני ריינר. לפני שנציג אותה באופן רשמי, אספר שהחיבור בינינו התרחש באמצעות הנתיב הטלפתי. לאחר ההרצאה שלי בכנס טסטין הבינלאומי ב-2014, אני, שלא הכרתי אותה קודם, ניגשה אליי ושאלה אותי אם תוכל לקבל את הרצאתי, ולאחר מכן כתבה לי שראתה שיש לי מאמר על חלומות טלפתיים, והאם תוכל לקרוא גם אותו, כי היא כותבת גם על טלפתיה ופרנסי. שומעים? טוב, אז אני עוסקת באני ריינר ואיך שהכרנו. אז שלחתי לה את המאמר שלי על טלפתיה, והיא שלחה לי את המאמר שלה, ומשם המשכנו מאז לדבר ולהידבר. וכשעופר מאורר ארגן את סמינר הקיץ הפסיכואנליטי בדוסקנה ב-2015, הרצינו בו שתינו על אור ועל חלומות טלפתיים, 
וההרצאה של אני שם מהווה את הטקסט המוקדם של הפרק שלה בספר שהיא ערכה לכבודו של גרודשטיין ושל ההרצאה שנשמע היום. האורחת השנייה, מרי טנס מסן פרנסיסקו, שגם הקשר שלי איתה התחיל מהמאמר על החלומות טלפטיים שהיא כתבה גם על כך, לא תגיע לצערנו היום בגלל הפחד שלה מהמצב בארץ. חלק מהדברים שהיא רצה לספר על פרויד ויחסו לטלפתיה, אשלים לכן אני בדברים שלי. אך במקומה מצטרפים אלינו אורחים לא צפויים ומיוחדים. דוקטור אילן ברנט יביא את תיאור האנליזה של הפסיכואנטיקאי הברזילאי ג'ון קריה דה מטוס את מטוס, אצל ביון המאוחר בשנים 1977-1979 עד חודש לפני מותו של ביון. זו אנליזה מאוד מיוחדת, כי ג'ון קריה עוזב בשבילה את ברזיל ועובר ללוס אנג'לס כדי להיות באנליזה אצל ביון, ולבקשתו הוא רואה את ביון שש פעמים בשבוע, שביום שני זו שעה כפולה, ויוצא עם ביון לחופשותיו כדי להמשיך באנליזה. אתי לנדאו, מנחת המושב, תדבר על כך מתוך היכרותה ובקיאותה הגדולה בביון ובאור. ועמית פכלר יגיע מאוחר, אבל יגיע, כדי להשוות זאת לאנליזה של פרויד עם פרנסי, שהייתה עוד יותר קצרה, וגם היא הייתה בחופשות. לאחר מכן, היה משבר גדול בין שניהם, בעוד שהאנליזה של ביון וג'נקריה הסתיימה בזיכרונות מרגשים. אני יודעת שהרבה פעמים עוזבים רבים את הכנס במושב האחרון, אבל אני מציעה פעם לא לפספס. אני רוצה להודות מאוד לאני ריינר ולאהובה ברקן על ההרצאות במושב הראשון והשני. אני רוצה להודות לשני המנחים, דוקטור אילן אמיר ואתי לנדאו פרכטר, ואני גם רוצה להודות לשני המתנדבים שיעזרו לנו בתרגום לאנגלית של הדברים עבור אני ריינר, גדעון לב, ובמיוחד מרים צ'ופרה, שהשקיעה אתמול מאמץ גדול כדי לעזור לנו בתרגום הדברים החדשים של המושב השלישי. וכמובן לצוות התוכנית, שירלי, שני וגלית, על עזרתן הגדולה. לפי בקשתה של אני ריינר, כמו שאילן כבר אמר, נתחיל במושב הראשון בנתיב הטלפטי של הטראומה הראשונית, ואחר כך נלך במושב השני עם ביון ווויניקוט לאזור ההוא, ונדבר על אהבה, שנאה ואמת בטיפול. כל ההרצאות, פרט להרצאה שלי, מופיעות לכם בחוברת. אז נראה. אני אינטרדוס יו. לפני שנתחיל, אני רוצה להודות לאופרה על שהזמנת אותי לדבר על הרצאה הזאת על הרצאה הזאת. אני חושב שהרצאה הראשונה שלי עם הרצאה הראשונה הייתה כשאני הייתי קנדידט בפסיכואנליסיס. הייתה לי פשוט שהתחילה את הפסיכואנליסיס. and very quickly regressed to a psychotic state. And she came uh, very, uh, in a very deep anxiety state to, to my uh, clinic, not in, an hour, not in her hour, and I couldn't see her. And she was very angry with me, and she disappeared. Uh, she didn't have a family, but um, she had many friends, and they were very, very uh, worried about her and, and we were looking and the police were looking for her and about a week later I was in my personal analysis I had a dream about her that she was hiding in a cave with tigers moving about the cave and then three, late, three days later the police found her in, in Gedi hiding in a cave so uh, in Gedi is, is a place in Israel it's a desert there's many caves over there and there are tigers over there so I was astonished and, and what made me understand how connected we were. And, 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 and it was a big shock for me, and then from then I started reading a lot and got a big interest about it and had many more experience with telepathic dreams, so I'm very excited about being to chair this uh, session. When I read both An uh, Annie's lecture and Ofer lectures, it was, they were both are very touching and very, I learned from them a lot, and. Uh, and I hope you will be, and it had a great impact on me, and I hope you will enjoy them as much as I did. So I want to introduce Annie. Annie Reiner is a senior faculty member and training analyst at the Psychoanalytic Center of California in Los Angeles. Her work was greatly influenced by Wilfred Bion, 
with whom she studied briefly in the 1970s. Her psychoanalytic articles have been published in many books and journals, and she is the author of two books, The Quest for Conscious and the Birth of the Mind, and Beyond and Being, Passion and the Creative Mind. She is the editor of the recent book entitled Of Things Invisible to Mortal Sight, celebrity, celebrating the work of James Grotstein, a collection of articles by respected Beyond scholars throughout the world. Reiner writes and lectures extensively about Beyond's mo most mysterious concept of O, most notably in her book, Beyond and Being. In addition to her work as a psychoanalyst, Dr. Reiner is an accomplished poet, playwright, and painter, the author of a book of short stories, four books of poems, and six children's books, which she, called, which she also illustrated. She maintains a psychoanalytic practice in Beverly Hills, California. Annie, please. I was going, uh, first of all, thank you all for having me and to Ofra for her work in getting me here. Thank you. Um, I was going to stand, which I prefer, but it's not really a podium, so there's no place to put the paper. So I'm going to, I'll sit here. Um, so when I was listening to Ofra, I only understood uh, two words, Annie Reiner. <laughs> And uh, so I imagine she said, so I don't know what she told you. I hope it's true. Um, but uh, I, I hope that, that you understand my English uh, well enough. The paper is translated, of course, so you can read along. Can you hear me? Yes, if you, no? No, okay, so forget it, so I'll hold it. Now can you hear me? Yes. Um, my paper is called Forensi's Astra and Bean's O, Early Trauma and the Flight from the Self. However, I have a short introduction, uh, and this is something that happened in a session last week. A uh, patient walked in, and I had the thought, before he sat on the couch, lay on the couch, um, he, that, that he doesn't know where he comes from. Now, he is uh, a sperm donor baby. You know what that means? Yeah. So, uh, this has, was something that had been discussed before, that I had said to him, you don't know where you come from, or you don't know what it means to be here, how you got here. But that, but we hadn't talked about it for about a year. Uh, he's been in analysis for five years. So, but this day, for some reason, that was a thought I had, and I, I wondered, as he lay there, didn't say anything at first, and I wondered what it, what the difference is for an embryo that's conceived in a laboratory as opposed to one that's conceived inside uh, his mother's body in passion or in love. And um, he then said, I had dinner with a friend last night who said maybe I could benefit from finding out about my birth father. So this was something he was not interested in, had never talked about. And so, apparently, we were on the same wavelength. I don't know why or how I received this communication, but that is the topic of this paper, and the topic also that Ofer is going to talk about. Um, interestingly, I think you wrote that in 2006, and that was the same year that I wrote a paper called uh, uh, Psychic Phenomena and capacity to think, I, something like that. And uh, so we were obviously in the Astra together long before we met. Um, anyway, the, the idea of O, 
that Bian talks about, which will come up quite a bit, reflects a deeply intuitive state in order to uh, apprehend it. But Bian made it clear that we also need evidence for our intuition in order to guard against unsubstantiated truths, uh, beliefs, untethered feelings, wild guesses. And Kant similarly said, intuitions without concepts are blind. Concepts without intuition are empty. And Bian said, our problem is how to introduce the intuitions to the concepts. And so the apprehension of O utilizes both. Or the ability to communicate what we have intuited through what is called this connection to O um, is, is also necessary. So I'll get to the paper. So for those of you who don't understand, you can follow it. Some of the ideas in the clinical diaries of Shandor Ferenczi are radical and at times questionable, but others have gained credibility as part of the foundation of object relations and relational therapies and are reflected in certain ideas of Winnicott, Bean, and other contemporary psychoanalysts. I will explore some intuitions Ferenczi struggled with in the early 1930s, in particular his concept of the astra, probably his most daring and mysterious idea, and how it relates to Bean's equally mysterious concept of O. Although Grotstein wrote, about, uh, wrote almost nothing about Frenzy, I chose to include this paper in, in the festschrift honoring Grotstein, in part because when I mentioned Frenzy's idea of the Astra to Jim in the year before his death, he was intensely interested and had not heard of it. He wanted to know more about it, and I felt some gratification in being able to offer a little something new to this esteemed scholar as slight reciprocation for all he had given me over the years. Ferenczi was original and controversial, which meant he was often deeply at odds with Freud. Ferenczi described analysts' pedantic behavior toward patients as desperately rigid clinging to a theoretical approach where head and thought replace heart and libido. This related to his idea of the confusion of tongues as a factor in clinical estrangement between analyst and analysand his bold admission that his own primitive feelings toward his patients reflected his hatred and overcompensating kindness toward his often enraged mother also helped to deepen ideas about countertransference. Some of his ideas were considered scandalous, like his practice of mutual analysis, where he advocated complete renunciation of all authority on both sides, giving the impression of two equally terrified children who understand and instinctively try to comfort each other. There were no analysts able then to analyze Ferenczi's early infantile states, but confessing his feelings to patients as part of mutual analysis created problems and he soon, thankfully, abandoned the idea. Nonetheless, there were impressive, innovative aspects to his ideas. He raised important questions about the need to understand primitive states in both analyst and analysand, and was the first to relate the etiology of mental illness to misattunements in the infant's relationship to the mother. Her empathic failure constituted trauma. This was a new idea. Ferenczi was Klein's first analyst, and his influence can be seen in her innovative ideas about influence, uh, infants, including what Frenzy called the exorbitant importance of the mother, largely overlooked by Freud. Klein, however, downplayed the effects of emotional trauma due to maternal detachment, focusing rather on the infant's projections of aggressive unconscious fantasies, which from Ferenczi's perspective were secondary to the early trauma. Freud, Ferenczi's analyst and mentor, dismissed many of his innovations as regressions to his childhood complexes. In, well, which in, indeed they were, but 
uh, it, it was said as a sort of judgment rather than something to work with. In an extensive examination of telepathic dreams in clinical work, Eschel quotes Jones's description of Freud's advice to Ferenczi to keep secret and refrain from publishing the results of his experimental ideas. Ferenczi did find support and inspiration from George Grodick, whose idea of the it, das es, was borrowed by Freud as the id. And have people read George Grodick? Does anyone? Yes? People have read his work? In America, not so much anymore. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. But Grodick's it reflects a more natural, powerful, and positive force in the mind that is more in line with Bean's transcendent aspect of O. But even Grodick was frightened by Frenzy's ideas about the atomization of the soul, the infant's experience of dissolution and nothingness. This, too, was later reflected in Winnicott's idea of the infant's fear of breakdown and Tustin's ideas of autistic spilling and dissolution. Ferenczi had an uncanny understanding of infants' greater mental sensitivities. The fetus, or neonate, he said, exists in a still half-dissolved state, their minds not yet crystallized, leaving their imaginations open to closer contact with the universe. In this egoless state, the infant was seen as inherently receptive to so-called supernormal fa faculties like clairvoyance and telepathic suggestion from a distance. Ferenczi called these infants wise babies and attributed the powers of spiritualists and mediums to their regressions to this infantile omniscience and supreme wisdom. These wise babies become split, he said, separating their instinctual selves from the madness or neglect of the parent. Ideas later represented in Fairbairn's notion of the infant's moral defense and Winnicott's facilitating or non-facilitating environment and the true and false self. As Winnicott put it, the false self organizes the suicide of the self, a mental suicide which obstructs the true nature and potential of the self. Ferenczi's wise babies are not far from Bean's notion of the infant's inherent potential and need for truth, including the truths Bean associates with O, ultimate reality, absolute truth, and the Godhead. As I will show in the clinical examples, however, there is a point at which these states of mind diverge. Although Freud took an official psychoanalytic stance against occult ideas and later, and against uh, some of Ferenczi's theories on the subject, he told Ernest Jones that he harbored a favorable prejudice in favor of telepathy. Ferenczi's idea of the astra describes a response to early trauma and emotional abuse in which the child leaves his painful, emotionally deprived se earthly self to seek comfort through contact with an all-knowing, omniscient part of the mind. He called it the astra from the Latin word for stars, um, for in what is essentially a dissociated state, the infant self might now be said to be far away in the stars. The pain, as Frenzy put it, is displaced to infinite distances. The emotional bond to the mother, already damaged by her absence or neglect, is thus further severed by the child, as is the bond to his or her own feelings. In this severe fragmentation of the self, the child is essentially in flight from reality. Gathering up the pieces into an omniscient and godly false self gives the child an illusion of wholeness or containment when in fact the self is further fragmented by this split from awareness. As we will see in the clinical examples, this flight is regressive, but also progressive in what Ferenczi calls its sudden development of intelligence, even clairvoyance. According to Ferenczi, the infant in contact with the astra is an omniscient self associated with God as savior and divine container. 
communication with the astral plane is later commonly viewed by the individual as spiritual enlightenment, a relationship with God. It is true in that it saves the child from unbearable pain. But this kind of divine container cannot really contain feelings. It contains the fragments of feelings. And the child is saved only from experiencing the terror of that disintegrated state. Understanding the difference requires us to distinguish between a defensive act of fusion with an idealized mother and Bean's idea of O as the Godhead, a capacity to connect with metaphysical realities. I have examined this distinction in detail elsewhere, but briefly, the former is a primitive belief in God as an idealized father or mother at the heart of Freud's view of God as an omnipotent defense, a neurosis, while the latter, Bean's O, reflects a Gnostic view based on an apprehension of meta metaphysical truths. The Gnostics, for instance, saw Christ not as the literal son of a reified God, but as a symbol of the esoteric knowledge in his teachings. It is the difference between a symbol and what Siegel called a symbolic equation. Although both the astra and O represent states of transcendence of the self, one cannot transcend oneself if one does not yet have one. The untraumatized infant who has not yet developed a self cannot transcend reality. He can only have a fantasy of escaping it. I use the term self, by the way, throughout this, as Bean used it, as synonymous with mind, soul, psyche, and personality. So in other words, when Bean uses, and this is, I, I've noticed that there is this confusion, that people take the fact that Bean talks about the mind and truth as if he's talking about, um, knowledge that can be known uh, through other than this metaphysical reality. Um, so, but it, it, for him it's the same. Mind, he's talking about, is the same as yourself, your personality, who you are, your spirit or soul. The capacity for what Bean calls at one minute with O, at one minute with reality, requires a capacity for selfhood which can be temporarily suspended while the child's foray into the infinite reality of the astral plane is in fact an escape from emotional life and selfhood. To further confuse matters, and this will become clearer in the clinical examples, to further confuse matters, these may describe the same realm of truth and ultimate reality which being intended by O, a non-human reality, as he put it, which is not beholden to human whims, it just is. However, the means by which this knowledge is attained changes the nature of that unchanging reality, O. Oh. A different container changes the experience of that which is contained within it. The undifferentiated infant, for instance, views things through an undifferentiated mind, which in the case of trauma fragments his sensations and observations. While the same reality may be, reserved, may be observed, being experienced by a disorganized or pre-organized self without the capacity to attach meaning to that which has been observed, attenuates the experience or perception of reality. Like Freud's idea of religion, the child identifies with an omnipotent parent, identified with an omnipotent parent is God, believing himself to be omniscient. I have often seen evidence of this contact with the astra in patients who are bright, intuitive, and seemingly wise, while also remaining confused and insecure. In effect, they do not know what they know. Having escaped from the self, one cannot learn from or give meaning to one's experiences. So in my view, this astral intuition into universal wisdom becomes a substitute for de the development of thinking. Fueled by terror and hatred of the object, the escape further ruptures an already fragmented mind and self. Like a mental nuclear fission, it splits the mind. 
At one minute with O, on the other hand, is fueled by libidinal forces of attachment, need for the object, and for truth, a kind of mental nuclear fusion where mental energy is generated by integration with the object that facilitates integration with the self. What seems to the astral child to be mental expansion is really a divided self bleeding out into an unbounded mental universe in manic identification with a now canonized mother god. Ferenczi's ideas about the astra are helpful in understanding splitting and dissociative states. It also provides more understanding of this area of higher knowledge and wisdom, which is part of Bean's notion of an infinite unconscious of transcendent truths. Oh. Um, the following clinical vignettes and lengthier clinical example are meant to show us some extremely wise babies whose capacities for intuition seem to me to be rare gifts. However, these gifts have serious negative effects as well, for their escapes to the aster were disengagements from feelings too painful to bear and disengagements from mothers unable to help them bear those feelings. I do wonder why the rage, shame, terror, and dissociation accompanying these states, these kinds of traumatic early events, result in violence, suicide, or psychosis in some, and in an idealized love of God in others, attempts, often misguided, at gaining access to truth. I felt the need to walk a fine line, protecting these intuitive gifts while interpreting their pathological implications. Uh, so before I get to this, this is not a theoretical, it's not even, these vignettes are not so much clinical, but at, to give you an idea of what this state of mind is, especially since when I wrote this, there was, there, and there continues to be a lot of um, backlash against Bean's idea of O oh, because people consider it out there in the stars, just something that doesn't make sense at all which is true. Slower? Okay. And do you want me to read slower when, where you have the translation as well? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this is Patricia. Although Patricia is bright, creative, and functions well at her job, I often feel she is not there with me in the room. Her sessions are important to her, but I'm not sure why, or what actually connects us. This detachment, also evident with her husband and children, was a necessary defense in dealing with a psychotic mother. She escaped her terror and despair, but did not know she was also escaping into her mother, fusing with her fragmented mind. Patricia idealized her own intuitive gift of understanding her mother better than anyone. In this vignette, we see an example of that intuitive gift. Patricia dreamt that a woman had seen her flirting with a man. She was concerned that the woman knew her husband. I sensed that this observer represented me, but so far had no real evidence for this. Later in the session, she described the observer as an independent thinker, the kind of woman who would have gone to Oberlin College and plays the harp. Um, she often expresses herself in creative images like this. She was just making this up. But in this case, her seemingly random imaginative description was in fact an uncanny trip to the Astra. Patricia had no way of knowing that my niece, who plays the harp, had that day left for a college tour of Oberlin College, an independent-minded experimental college. Given the relatively few, uh, relatively small number of people at Oberlin or on Earth who play the harp, the statistical odds against her putting these things together coincidentally were staggering. I was not consciously thinking about my niece, but I am close to her and unconsciously she was likely somewhere in my unthought thoughts. The specificity 
of Patricia's description suggests that he, she had somehow bridged the gap between our minds, perhaps trying to figure out who I am, the nature of our connection, <clears throat> or my connection to others. Her emotionally fragmented mother allowed no real emotional connection so Patricia had to rely on these astral connections, transporting herself into her mother, or in this case, me, in an effort to locate me. Is that clear? So she had no other way of understanding anything except to become the other person, which in a way is what we're doing as analysts, but as I say, in a very different way. Patricia's in intuition, while impressive, was a substitute for, f for feeling and thinking, derived from a serious rift in her ego. She perceived a reality about me, oh, but with no knowledge of her own perception, she cannot use what she intuits to know about her perceptions. Even her conscious intuitions cannot be trusted. So she can tell me that she picked up something about someone and is very astute, but she, she doesn't believe herself, even if it's something she knows she's picked up. I often felt her attachment to me and her warmth, but this can be misleading, for she could not feel it. With no awareness of any need to connect with me, the actions she took to connect with me had no meaning. The infant's oneness with the mother <coughs> is a healthy part of development, but it is only one factor in a healthy adult relationship based on two-ness. Ferenczi's theory suggests that these wise babies' forays into the astra do provide a kind of knowledge, but in my view, these become substitutes for thinking upon which the infant continues to rely, because lacking a true emotional bond to the mother, thinking was never an option. <sighs> These omniscient mental states become deeply ingrained and idealized, and my work with Patricia has been a slow process of unearthing the painful needs long evaded with this primitive escape. Um. Okay. Oops. This is Danielle. This uncanny ability to transcend boundaries of time, space, and mind was also present in Danielle, whose multiple early traumas began with a premature birth in which both she and her mother almost died, followed by weeks, two weeks of separation. She then endured early sexual abuse by a relative and the violent rages of a jealous older sister, all of which were unacknowledged by her emotionally immature mother. Danielle survived, thanks in part to what I see as her constitutional aptitude for love and curiosity, along with precocious creative gifts, which at least <laughs> provided a means of expression. One Sunday afternoon, I lectured at the Los Angeles Jung Institute. At Danielle's session the next day, she said she had missed me over the weekend. She later mentioned being at a bookstore on Sunday when a documentary of Carl Jung caught her eye. She's not an analyst or therapist and had never mentioned Jung, but during the time I was presenting my paper, she had rented and watched the DVD. I thought about whether it was necessary to reveal this uncanny event to her in my interpretation, Generally, I don't disclose aspects of my life, even with someone like Danielle, for whom events such as these are not so unusual. Transference issues and other primitive levels of the patient's self are also usually expressed with these astral jaunts, and these can often be taken up without injecting my actual life into the mix. However, it is my job to interpret the central issue of the session to her, and it did feel central here. For one thing, the, jo um, the subject of Danielle's psychic intuitions had arisen recently in terms of her fear of being strange or crazy, and she had today expressed having missed me. 
This session seemed to reflect a, a primal fear of losing me, so I told her that in her helplessness at not knowing where I was over the weekend, she had not only gone looking for me psychically, she seemed to have found me at the Jung Institute. She was amazed to recognize this kind of waking dream as an attempt to help her feel and think about something unthinkable. I said that this unconscious daydream was an attempt to was an attempt to connect with me as she had desperately attempted to fi find her mother at birth. She said that she often has the experience of scanning the universe as if looking for something. This seemed to me like a fair description of the Astra. These scans recently led her as far as Norway. In a Thursday session, Danielle said she dreamt about a cute little boy with an accent, sadly singing, It's a little reindeer. Where are the reindeer? Where have they gone? And it went on and on. And she had no associations, which is very unusual for her. But two days later, it was reported in the newspaper that 323 reindeer huddling together for warmth in a storm in Norway had been struck by lightning and killed. A catastrophic event, like her birth, toward which she is drawn. Uh, so, if this were an isolated incident, one might think it was coincidence, I doubt it. But she had also dreamt about thousands of people dying in Thailand before the tsunami in 2004 and presaged other such disasters as well. She is attuned to disasters all over the world, as if a mental channel had opened in her with the original loss and near death of her mother at birth. This remains an open channel to which she has been unconsciously attuned her whole life, much as others relive their early traumas in more familiar ways like transference or repetition compulsion. I suppose it uh, it is a form of transference, a relationship to that early void, but reaches into vast distances around the world. How do we understand these things? We don't, not really. But Danielle's trip to the Astra to find her mother seemed to be a self-preservative attempt at attachment when deprived of the actual possibility of attachment. She did not know why she was drawn to the Jung documentary until it was given meaning. Although she could and did say that she missed me, her emotional detachment left her no means to represent her need for attachment mentally. Feeling is replaced by action. So the action of astral scanning not only substitutes for thinking, it also obstructs its development. The traumatized baby unconsciously experiences the trip to the Astra as evidence that her helplessness has been omnipotently conquered. She cannot then find a way to satisfy that need in the real world with a real person. By interpreting that her mind had taken her to me, she could begin to feel the painful urgency for a real me as, a, as distinct from the connection she has forged to an imaginary me in her mind. Uh, I will mention one more example with Danielle related to countertransference. To preface it, I will say that she is a gifted editor at a well-known publisher. It so happened that something I was writing had been discussed with my editor whose creative vision I dis with whose creative vision I disagreed. He holds power over the publication and I was feeling very upset not wanting to compromise my vision. At that point, Danielle dreamt. Now, I wasn't thinking about it in the session again, but I was occupied by it. I explained to, here's her dream. I explained to L, a writer friend, my new system of working with writers. L understood and was impressed. Then I was speaking to my agent who said I'd been given jobs on several projects now and in the past but the agent never made the, de made the deals. I didn't understand. So I, I haven't gone into all the associations. As I said, it's more to give you an idea of this uh, function in the mind. 
but she does, she, Danielle does have a new system of helping writers, which she has talked about. So I sensed that I was the writer, both the writer and the agent, and that Danielle was picking up my problems with my project. I knew that with her editorial talent, and she uses her psychic abilities in her work with writers, so she's apparently brilliant at what she does. And she could probably easily have solved these problems. Intuiting my distress, she seemed to have gone into the astral universe to help me. When I told her this, she's not using astral, but when I told her she was picking up something about me, uh, she said, so am I going backwards and trying to save my mother? While this was true in a way, her response was an attempt to spare me and blame herself. I said that I thought she had sensed me struggling with something which had disturbed her and she wanted to help. At the end of the dream, she intuits that this, as in her infancy, is her job to help me. Unconsciously, she is already at work. For I, like the agent, have given her a job, and yet no official deal has been struck, nothing that is in reality. While it certainly does also relate to her mother, this is not strict. So in other words, the mother gives the infant the job implicitly because they need so much help. And so the infant takes the job. But nobody knows but the infant, nobody, even the infant, knows they're doing this job. It's not strictly transference, for it derives from a real, unconscious, current interaction between us. And again, she deserves to know my part in it. Throughout her life, she has tried unconsciously to help her whole family, and now feels me as her problem too, when neither, in reality, is her problem. I was aware that in my frustration, I must have reached out to her in the Astra, and working with this dream had given me the opportunity to gather up my own resources and leave the poor woman alone. The infant gets no contract to help the mother, no remuneration, and yet dives right in and attempts to do the job, giving rise to confusion and intense hatred and resentment. One might see this as a bit of mutual analysis, what happened between us, of the kind that Ferenczi envisioned, but it does call for dogged attention to boundaries, which of course was not available to Ferenczi since he had not been analyzed at this level. Okay, so this is a, a, a Keith. Not every traumatized infant patient manages to contact this proto-mental level of knowledge in the astra, but this uncanny ability to transcend boundaries of time, space, and mind was also central to Keith's personality. This intelligent, engaging man grew up with divorced parents, a bipolar mother, an emotionally detached father, and also the mother at the birth was overly drugged, and so she could not help in the, pro in the birth process. She couldn't push. And so this infant, right from the beginning, was left on her own. Uh, having as her partner a dead mother. He was also weaned. Okay. Okay. Keith, uh, okay. So he was also weaned at three months when his mother returned to work, and he refused the bottle, waiting all day sometimes for his mother to return. This still starving infant developed an eating disorder, binging on sweets, uh, giving him.
אחת, שתיים, אחת. אחת, שתיים, אחת, שתיים. אוקיי, can you hear? I'll do my best here. אחד, אחד, אחד. It works for one sentence. Okay, we'll try. Ready? Sorry about this. So he binges on, uh, on sweets, giving him the illusion of control over... Okay. Hello. זה נכבה, וזה נדמה לי הבטריות שלא נגמרו. אחת, שתיים, אחת, חד חד אחד, שתיים, אחד, שתיים, שלוש, שומעים? עוד יותר חזק, להגביר קצת. אחד, שתיים. בסדר. Okay. Uh, as I say, uh, he developed an eating disorder. Uh, are we having problems up there? You can hear?
Okay. Um, years of idealizing me were followed by years of distrust, after which he showed a bipolar mental, a maternal transference to me, both appreciating and distrusting me in almost every session. At the end of each session, he is frequently grateful to feel more himself, but by the next session, it is almost as if this never happened. He start, but we've been through this enough that he knows, uh, he's aware that he, of this uh, dynamic. So he starts many sessions saying, I have forgotten who you are, for he is now aware of this severe emotional split and every gap between sessions arouses the loss and terror of that early weaning. When I am cast as the psychotic and or weaning mother, anything good is experienced as bad and evacuated. As he began to remember the helpful me, he felt tortured by feelings of need and envy. In this Monday session, Keith announced that he was mad at me for not being his friend and being in his life. Such direct admission of my importance to him was unusual, especially after week weekend breaks, so this bespoke both a positive and negative connection. He said, I dreamt I was climbing a steep, precarious flight of tiny stairs. I was scared, but somehow I made it. Getting down was even scarier on a narrow escalator with no sides and nothing to hold on to. An Asian man worked there. He was sort of floating alongside me to catch me in case I fell, so I was less scared. Keith described the stairs as just like the Mayan ruins in Mexico, which have these tiny little steps. Uh, the, okay. So I immediately thought about the day before reading my new children's books to a group of children. The books were displayed in a little theater with a steep decorative stairway with steps too narrow to climb. And upon arriving, I said to someone that the stairs reminded me of the Mayan pyramids. This uncanny coincidence made me think that Keith, like Danielle, had followed me psychically, wanting, as he said, to be part of my life. Or perhaps jealous I was with these other children. Keith spoke of working in Mexico years ago. He had lost weight and he felt great, but he got horribly depressed while he was there. He associated the, oh, he said, uh, I gained back all the weight and more. I was lost, devastated, no idea who I was. He associated the Asian man with Japanese screens in my office and with his meditation teacher whom he loves and admires. Over the weekend, I, like his mother, had disappeared and Keith was devastated to find me gone. I thought he had closed the gap by finding me in that deeply intuitive astral realm, and the rest of his dream added further evidence of this. I was then in a bookstore with a big display of a new book, something about energy connections between emotional states. It seemed like an important book, maybe like Stephen Hawking's The Theory of Everything, about black holes. The bookstore display made it an even harder to see these as coincidences. While again, I rarely divulge anything about myself personally, this was also central to his anxiety. And so I said that his lost self had gone looking for me and unconsciously found me. He was moved and mystified that his mind could dream this, as was I, but it shed light on the dire straits he is in. The, the abrupt weaning, and I thought this was a sort of, um, you know, um, mythic dream. It had a very, the story was all there. It's all encompassing about his mental state. So I didn't say all this to him, but uh, this is how I looked at the dream after. Um, the abrupt weaning had 
long ago plunged him into a black hole from, from which he has not yet returned. While he often sounds present, he resides far away in unfathomable mental space. It helps explain his difficulty in remembering me from session to session. For each session, he has to traverse the universe to find his way to, to me for a connection, which is only half lived in this dreamlike internal reality. While I remain a sort of hologram of his internal dead mother, somewhere he recognizes his analysis as an important book I am writing for him about the black hole inside where that ghostly lost infant waits for me to read, his, to read him his story. The Astra, and I also thought later, I thought the stairs was an interesting thing, or the escalator, you know, in terms of this idea of the Astra going someplace very high and being very frightened. How could he get back down? The Astra is a kind of black hole in the personality where infants often do get lost. These children of the Astra are what Grotstein called orphans of O or orphans of the real. With no opportunity for real attachment, they exist in varying degrees of self-imposed exile from inner and outer reality. After at least a decade of analysis for Danielle and Keith, these patients I've presented all function well, despite severe experiences of maternal deprivation. While they suffer intermittent high degrees of anxiety, each seems to have a constitutional aptitude for truth, which, while badly battered, endured sufficiently to be developed, perhaps due in part to the information gained in the astra. Its defensive function, idealization, omnipotence, mindlessness, were extremely damaging, but this defense may also have helped in their survival. As I suppose all defenses do. While I see a relationship between the wisdom of the Astra and the absolute truth of O, it is O through a fragmented looking glass, for it, also related, it is also related to the autistic's child, a dissolution into nothingness, and Winnicott's idea of early breakdown. We might say that O, an infinite reality too vast for our, in, for our finite minds to encompass, is the theory of everything while uh, the astra is also a theory of nothingness, fantasies of lost children drawn into contact with a disembodied utopian universe that substitutes for the idealized mother. Nonetheless, each of us must retain the infant's capacity to become the universe in this way, not as an escape from pain, but in the development of healthy attachments in which ego capacities of organization, boundaries, and logic can also develop. What Freud called the infant's oceanic feeling, Bian and Buddhists call at one moment a suspension of ego functions of reason and understanding that facilitates the sense of boundarylessness being in which deeper understanding can be intuited. So in summary, we encounter these sorts of uncanny connections in analysis, but it is difficult to say what they are. Fantasies, dreams, daydreams. They might be described, as Keith put it, as energy connections between emotional states. And in fact, uh, I won't tell you the whole thing, but Bian said something about each analyst has to uh, know what his art is. And someone in the audience asked a question, well, what if you're not an artist? And he said, then you're in the wrong job. <laughs> and it's this idea of, and so what I often thought of as what I do in analysis is sculpting energy. So there's energy that comes off the patient and that mingles with mine and somehow through these uh, non-physical means, they get sculpted into something that has meaning. Um, but anyway, so I think Keith put it very well, energy connections between emotional states. Apprehensions of O may also be said to be connections of energy which are ultimately unfathomable but nonetheless exist. 
It is there that the analyst must go to meet these wise babies hypothesized by Ferenczi. As we see with these, and I think many other patients, we must become aware that some patients are like holograms, projections into absent objects, representing absent aspects of themselves. In their eyes, we too are holograms. For these patients, connections are, lar are largely illusions meant to protect them from terrifying and ongoing traumas they unconsciously sense in their minds. And we can waste a lot of time in the illusion that we are speaking with a person who is actually present in the room. Frenzy asked, who is crazy? We or the patient? The children or the adults? Perhaps it is both. For as Ferenczi and Bean pointed out, primitive states of mind exist in all of us. Hopefully, the analyst has experienced his or her primitive or psychotic states sufficiently, for upon this oneness, with our most primitive experiences, rests our ability to be, to think, and according to Bean, to do analytic work. It takes courage to contact what Ferenczi saw as the infant's early sense of dissolution, to suspend memory, desire, and understanding in order to be one with painful experience. A large part of our work is to develop a mind able to contain such vast feelings. Bean once said that our goal is not to add new theories to psychoanalysis, but simply to find a way to tolerate what we feel. And that is far from simple. Thank you very much, Annie, for a beautiful lecture. I thought, while hearing you and reading your paper for a couple of times, I thought that what you, what you are trying to tell us is that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis and the psychoanalyst, the psychotherapist, help change the defensive use of astral telepathic capacities of the patient to a connecting and communicating one use of these astral, capacity, these astral and telepathic capacities. Yeah. Oops, this is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, and I actually, it was with Danielle, I think I called her. Um, and I, ha I would love to, where is Shirley? I would love to show that picture. Anyway, but in the meantime, um, I did once say to this patient, you know, I, I said there was, you had to walk a fine line, not wanting to, to uh, obstruct her gift, but still to help her understand what was not working about it. And I did say to her that she has this gift and this intuition, which is very use, can be very useful, but she first needs to know what it means to stand on the earth. And that she does not know. And so that's, yeah, that's our job. Um, before we go to, uh, I think um, the patient who I spoke about who ran away and had a te telepathic dream about says the, the big issue is to change a defect to an affect. So that's to have an effect on somebody. So I think she's right. So yeah. then, uh, we'll oh, change the so offer. One, one more thing. Uh, did you, are you going to put that up there? Okay. If not, it's fine. But if so, I will... Are you going to put it up there, the picture? Okay. So this was Danielle's. I, I, I actually terminated with her on uh, last Thursday after 21 years. And as I say, she was sexually abused by her father for about five years till he died. She was premature, so it took a long time. And plus, you know, I had to learn also along the way. But... Um, so on the last day, she came in, and she, was, she did not want to go. But she knew she had to go, and I knew she had to go to live her life, because she has a big life, and she needs to find out what that is. So she came in, and she had a gift. And she said, she gave it to me, and I asked her if she wanted me to open it. She said yes, and I'm glad I did, because I wouldn't have known what the hell it was. So 
I opened it and that's what I saw. I didn't know. I sort of, it was a framed picture and I sort of held it up to the wall and so the arrow was pointing at me and I thought, is she talking to my other patients? Like telling them, don't give her the shit that, you get, that she gave me? Anyway, she said that she was thinking, what do I give Annie? What do you give someone who you feel saved your life? And she was walking along the street and thinking this. And she, she said, and she went like this, what do I give her? And she stepped up on the curb and she saw that. This is a curb, this is a street. This is the curb, the orange part is the curb. And that's the sidewalk. And on the sidewalk was graffiti that said, Love Annie. <laughs> so when I say she's psychic and has these synchronistic things, it happens to her all the time. But it was the perfect gift, I thought. Okay, so it, it, 